So I'm now very honored to introduce Dr. Jeff Shuren, Director of the Center for Devices and Radiological Health at the United States Food and Drug Administration for an hour of Q&A discussion. Dr. Shuren has been the Center Director since 2009 and during his career has also held an academic appointment and remained board certified in neurology. I'd also like to ask Dr. Neil Fearnot, President of Cook Advanced Technologies and President of Med Institute, as well as a Purdue alum and adjunct faculty to join me in the conversation. I know for those of you in the audience, many of you have sent questions in advance. Uh, we've gone through and tried to identify a number of different topics of interest. Uh, I'm not sure that we're gonna be able to get through all of those, uh, but if there are additional questions or topics that you would like to have discussed, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll see if we can get to those in the hour that we have. Uh, thank you. I'm just trying to check if Dr. Shuren has had a chance to join. Uh, I know he's had a pretty busy schedule and we're just right at 10.15. Um, I, I don't see his name up there. Uh, thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Oh, great. Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to have you. And, and Neil, you as well. Well, uh, delighted to be here. I uh, wish it could be in person, but uh, maybe uh, maybe another day. I agree completely. All right. So we've got a bunch of questions. Um, I can start with one that's uh, somewhat of a general one and maybe a, a two-part question as well. Uh, so if you're looking to the next few years, are there any emerging areas that you see uh, becoming of increasing importance for innovation in devices, diagnostics, digital health, et cetera? And then the second part related to that, what may be some new strategic priorities for CDRH? All right, so we only have an hour, right? All right. <laughs> um, well, let me hit, you know, one of the big areas. I think, you know, COVID-19 essentially put all the efforts on remote provision of clinical care on steroids. You know, we'd already been moving down this pathway with telehealth and technologies and increasingly can provide care in the home setting, whether it being at home or at work, in the supermarket. But with COVID, because so many people could not get to their healthcare providers, we've really seen an increased need for that capability. And certainly the FDA has tried to do its part with a number of policies that made it easier for um, modifying technologies already authorized on the marketplace to um, uh, include remote capabilities because we knew about that need for care and also allowing for certain technologies to be out there to help people to receive care. For example, for a number of psychiatric conditions and support you know, with behavioral therapy uh, because people couldn't get into the office, uh, if you will, for care. And I think moving forward, we're going to see all of that accelerate. And of course, digital health technologies are going to play a prominent role. Um, probably number two there, robotics uh, continue to pick up and we're going to see that. And I do think the digital health technologies and some of these AI capabilities are also further advancing the use of robotics. Um, and that's probably the next point we'll see too, is really a convergence of different kinds of technologies coming together. You know, in the diagnostics world, I think we're gonna move increasingly to more tests that are being provided point of care and at home than we did before. I think COVID is also pushing us in that direction. And of course, looking at even diagnostics that are non-invasive. So lots of exciting things that are on, you know, the horizon. And a, and a silver lining, you know, out of, out of COVID too. Um, priorities, it's a little unusual for us because, you know, we set our priorities for a number of years. We were going to not end, but transition to build on those at the end of 2020. Because of COVID, we did not feel that we as a center were well positioned to make our, that change. Uh, COVID has been our, at the, you know, first and foremost activity we're engaged in. So we made a conscious decision to stay the course on our priorities in 2021. In addition, we just kicked off our negotiations with industry and we'll have discussions with the public about the reauthorization of our user fee um, act. And as part of that, we really talk about where that program should be down the line. So we felt, you know what, let's have those discussions. Let's figure out where we're going in uh, the user fee act and that program and then incorporate that. And maybe as we get catch our breath a little bit with COVID and what we learned out of COVID-19 to inform where the center goes for its priorities 
as we roll into 2022. Dr. Sharon, you mentioned, um, you know, the challenges that we have, and, and of course there are increasing challenges in getting the products through all of the hoops that we need to get them through. And so could you talk a minute about collaborations and, and those types of interactions between the various groups that might be involved in bringing a technology um, to the marketplace and, and how the agency has supported those. I know you've been a great supporter of like HBD and um, ISCTR and those sort of things. Could you talk to us a little bit about uh, the priorities in the uh, in CDRH for supporting those collaborations? Well, certainly, uh, you know, very important question and, and please call me Jeff. Um, if you really think about that journey as you go from all the way from concept um, to uh, marketing, reimbursement, adoption, and then sort of that life cycle of continuous modifications, there's lots of pitfalls along the way. And I think one of the challenges in this space is that you need to be, to be successful, particularly for truly innovative technology, you've got to tap into a variety of different communities to be successful. And it's very hard to do on your own. If you're a startup, very, very challenging to ever go it alone. You know, big companies, they're starting to build out their relationships and capabilities, but you know, for lots of the industry, hard to do. And so if you think about it, if you're gonna be successful, you need to figure out, you've got regulatory issues to think through, you've got scientific issues to think through, not just on um, as you move in the development of your technology, but in the evaluation of your technology something we should talk about, all the regulatory science side of the house, the tools, the methods, approaches for understanding the safety effect of the, really the performance and the quality of that device, understanding the perspective of patients. You know, are you developing technologies, are you assessing them, and are you positioning them in ways that are best meeting the needs of patients and looking at things that matters for patients. Same on the provider side, because ultimately you want that adoption have you taken that perspective into account? And certainly payers, if you're not convincing them, um, you can get through the FDA, but as you know, um, the technology is not going any, anywhere, really patients lose out you know, as a result. Um, so if you think about all those are key players um, and you need to get them all, all engaged and you need to do it you know, early in the game and keep at it. Um, it's really begged a question in the med tech space, about how we're gonna solve this. Because if we can solve this issue about helping particularly, you know, innovators on connecting with those communities and providing the kinds of feedback and advice they need to be successful. So they are strategic from day one um, and they're using what, first of all, better opportunities to get funding and better use of the funding that you get uh, and don't go down rabbit holes. We need to think differently in this space than we have done before. And FDA has established relationships with the patient communities, with the provider communities, with the payer communities, all of which we continue to build out. And of course, obviously very strong relationship with the industry side of the house who we deal with all the time. And we have been looking at ways of how can we now take all of those pieces and pull it together. Essentially, you can almost think about a suite of services that could be available, connecting all the key players so we can move important technology through the pathway. And those that are gonna fail, fail early. Those are gonna succeed, help them succeed, help them succeed quickly and support, you know, reimbursement and ultimate adoption in the marketplace. Great, that, thank you very much. That was really helpful. Um, we have a number of um, academic um, folks on the phone call, uh, for someone who's just getting into this area of device development, has an innovative idea, maybe from a, you know, even a graduate student or, or someone early in their um, career as a professor, um, how would you suggest, Jeff, that they um, actually um, engage the rest of the community? Do you have any ideas or thoughts about where that early academician could actually engage um, and become familiar with all those, the rest of the groups that you had just mentioned. 
Well, that is challenging. You know, if you're doing it on your own, um, kind of hard to do. I'd sort of say, do you have, you know, within um, the institution you work or within the state or within the region, are those already established? Um, you may have uh, some institutions uh, are already doing that, and particularly if they've created a bit of a innovation hub and a place where technology is being developed uh, and evaluated. Uh, certainly, you've got sometimes regional associations who are building those bridges in the, you know, out there at both the, the local and at the national level are also, you know, great ways to tap in. So I wouldn't reinvent the wheel. I'd sort of ride the coattails of the folks who have already kind of, you know, built those relationships. So maybe picking up on a couple ideas that you raised in the, the previous question. Uh, you know, the regulatory science side, I think one area when I was in industry and, and, and then in academia, uh, you know, I wasn't real familiar with it, but the Office of Science and Engineering Labs, uh, you know, I've tried to learn a little bit more there on and kind of what they do, um, you know, how that role plays into innovation uh, and regulatory science. I don't know if you'd be able to go into some more thoughts on uh, the value of that and, and everything they're doing and then how a, from an academic research perspective, or, or an industry perspective, how can we get more involved in uh, participating with uh, the development they're doing of different medical device tools? Yeah, thank you for, for raising our Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories, or OCEL. I, I kind of view OCEL as a as a not well-known national treasure. Um, so at the FDA, on the medical device side, we have um, a whole building plus that is devoted to uh, laboratories. We have um, um, almost two dozen laboratories um, that we can also take down, build up as uh, needs change. And they serve a number of roles. First of all, they are experts in their fields. Many of them are in disciplines that are cross cutting uh, over different technologies. And we leverage them in the day-to-day -day work that we do at the center all the time with their expertise. And that may be in our pre-market reviews post-market surveillance activities. They also are engaged in conducting practical research. You know, it's not the base, it's not basic science. It is about problem solving or developing new tools to better assess and understand uh, technologies. And I'll give you a flavor of some of the work that they've done. I mean, they did, I think the first in the world truly fully in silico clinical trials. Um, assessing digital mammography versus uh, digital breast tomosynthesis. And it was all virtual patients and phantoms. They did that study literally in days as opposed to what otherwise would take years. And they demonstrated that in appropriate circumstances, you can do a study with just virtual patients. I mean, truly, truly remarkable. I mean, they identified early biomarkers for a number of uh, ophthalmic conditions like age-related macular degeneration and glaucoma. This is now being used to develop diagnostics, new diagnostics um, for ophthalmic disease. Uh, they were responsible for the first technical guidance, I think in the world, um, on additive manufacturing. And we've seen a lot more innovation in that space, you know, as a result. And they developed a, a methodology for assessing the cleanliness of scopes that are used in hospitals or clinical settings. We all know challenges face in sort of cleaning and disinfecting duodenoscopes. This is an inexpensive method that can be used in hospitals to kind of assess, you know, cleanliness. Do they get the crap, you know, out of that scope? All developed in those labs. So very, very, you know, practical. And a lot of the work they do is collaborative. We do collaboration all the time. Now we're not a big funding organization. If you're looking at us saying you're going to fund our research, eh, not so much, but we bring the expertise of the FDA. We've got our laboratory capabilities and we've got our other partners. So, you know, for folks who are looking to maybe do work with us, that could happen in a number of different ways. If you're an individual researcher, uh, we have, you know, one-off research projects with uh, academic researchers and others, if there's common interests and we're, all bring something to the table. We have folks from academia who spend time in our laboratories, you know, folks who come at this different stages of their career. I mean, very early, they might be through a fellowship program, but otherwise maybe here on a sabbatical. 
Um, and that's, you know, great for us. We learn from them and hopefully they learn from us and we build strong relationships that really can last, you know, last a lifetime. We have lots of ambassadors out there in the world. And then I sort of think beyond just, you know, the individual researcher, um, particular programs or departments, or let's even think more expansively, states or regions, um, if they're well organized and we've got common interests, we'll build those relationships to have ongoing dialogues, collaborations, projects uh, underway. And we've done that, you know, with different institutions and we're looking to grow that. Um, so uh, certainly if you're interested, come talk to us. Uh, you can talk to me or Edmar Jerison is the director of OCEL and he will talk to anybody. Um, and he's looking, you know, to make friends and to expand our partnerships and collaborations. Um, and I'm happy to give you his home phone number after. Maybe not his home phone. Yeah, we've had, a, uh, George and myself had a chance to talk with him and, and uh, Dorn, who worked closely with him. Uh, it's a wonderful group, and I certainly learned a lot uh, on, on what they do, which I didn't have any idea of everything that was going on. That's, that's great. You talked about um, when you were doing a pretty comprehensive list of the different uh, groups that have different viewpoints about uh, medical um, products. Uh, you mentioned about the patients, and I know over the last several years, the patient's viewpoint, patient reported outcomes, um, data that are derived from patients because of the digital health um, equipment, um, all point to an increasing role in understanding the patient's experience with a new technology. Could you talk a little bit about um, that and about the FDA uh, pushing or, or pr supporting that kind of um, effort? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so, I mean, patients, they are at the heart of what we do. I mean, improving the health quality of life of patients is our job number one. That's the that's the way we view ourselves. And we, we tried to make that explicit in a vision we put out for the center back in like 2012 um, that intentionally started with the word patients. Patients in the U.S. have access to high quality, safe and effective medical devices of public health importance first in the world. We want good technology, high quality, safe and effective. We want patients to have timely access. And we started with the word patients. And that kicked off um, an entire effort that has spanned now almost a decade on building out our relationships and the science uh, of patient input. Um, right after that 2013, we had an initiative on a patient, uh, patient preference information. How do we scientifically understand the preferences, the benefit risk trade-offs of patients are willing to make around technologies, for example, because there is a whole science to it. Because uh, we know you can talk to patients and some things are very clear, but other things you really got to tease out. There's heterogeneity in patient populations and there are lots of methods and you know, tools that can be used to tease it out. You know, we expand this into our partner with patients um, uh, initiative that was trying to move patients from more passive recipients of information or their own advocates to truly be partners with the FDA in the work that we do. And one of the results is we established the very first advisory committee at the FDA that is solely made up of patients, patient representative, patient engagement advisory committee. They've had four meetings now and they just deal with issues important to patients. Uh, patient generated uh, information, you know, is one of the topics uh, that we tackled. Um, we've put a lot of effort in patient reported outcomes uh, and that's gone out in guidance documents, um, in work with developers. Uh, we now see that the pivotal clinical trials, you know, are high risk and over devices. The majority of them now are include patient reported outcomes. And they're moving from just for information purposes to secondary endpoints. And even now, in some cases, you know, primary endpoints. Patient preference information, again, guidance. Um, we work with developers and with different institutions like the Michael J. Fox Foundation to do these studies. We've got over, over two dozen either completed or underway. And we are using this information to make regulatory decisions because if patients are willing to accept certain risks, even if our reviewers say, I don't know if I would, 
um, we're going to take that into account. And some technologies have come onto the market or expanded their use like solo uh, hemodialysis at home um, based upon patient preference information. We look to the future, um, patient generated health information, the use of wearables. We have uh, some pilots underway in looking at it. Um, so expect more on that topic. Um, and our relationship to patients as well. We've created what this called um, the patient and uh, um, uh, uh, caregiver uh, uh, collaboratory that essentially is relationships with over half a dozen uh, patient advocacy groups. And we call on them as experts uh, and use them in the work that we do. And kind of a next phase, and I, I'm rambling on, so maybe we'll leave this for another question or something else, is our work on collaborative communities, which I think takes the role of patients to an entirely new level. And we had a comment or a question from one of the participants today. Could you mention anything about um, FDA's future thinking about laboratory developed tests? Well, I'll, I'll give you our, our thinking for the past, you know, 20 years, <laughs> uh, you know, Laboratory developed tests, um, you know, and they're tests, of course, for others, you know, they're made by a laboratory just for use in that laboratory and they're not, you know, making other technologies, you know, with it, um, collection devices all. Um, as a matter of policy, when we established the medical device program, you know, over four decades ago, the agency had decided not to enforce its regulatory requirements when a test is developed by a laboratory just for use in the laboratory, as opposed to uh, a lab that makes a test and they're distributing it or a traditional commercial manufacturing. That's because at the time the tests were simple, lower risk, a lot of reliance on the skilled laboratory, and they really were just being used more in hospital settings, very close relationship with treating physicians. That world has changed, obviously. And LDTs are critically important in healthcare. I mean, we want to see more innovation in that space. Uh, we want to see that thrive. On the flip side, we've also seen a number of LDTs that really have put patients at risk, ones with very poor science behind it and not good for patients, a lot of healthcare dollars being spent on it, um, things for tests for ovarian cancer, some of the pharmacogenetic tests, um, a variety. And we've put some of this information out there. We've had number of safety alerts. Um, and for about 20 years, we've been looking to pull back that policy. And obviously there are different feelings around it. We put out guidance, um, draft guidance and held uh, public meetings. Essentially, um, a few years ago, because of the interest of Congress and the interest in the community to find more of a legislative solution. And at the same time, put in place a more modern framework for in vitro diagnostics, what some people are now call in vitro clinical tests, we said we would work with Congress on that framework. We'd hold off from doing something administratively on the part of the FDA. And we'd been engaged with folks on the Hill and obviously in the lab community and the you know traditional commercial manufacturers try to find resolution. I think that would be in the best interest of public health, that we had a very clear uniform you know, rational fame framework that drives innovation or provides appropriate patient safeguards. And also that leverages things that are in the CLIA program. Um, you know, CLIA doesn't really get to the individual test itself and its accuracy and reliability, um, but it does get to certain aspects around lab operations that are relevant things that we touch on in our quality systems. And you know, our perspective has been, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So let's leverage CLIA you know, as much uh, and as appropriate as possible, uh, and then build on the other pieces that really uh, make sense. And there's some you know, interesting ideas out there. There's been some draft legislation that uh, public comment has come back in. So that's my hope that we will eventually see that. And ultimately, I think that's gonna be uh, in the best interests of patients. So Jeff, you mentioned collaborative communities, uh, and certainly it's an area we're interested in. I wonder if you have some thoughts on kind of where you've seen those be successful in the past, uh, you know, and, and as someone is looking to build a new collaborative community, what are some key steps and uh, ways to make that successful? And so collaborate, like I mentioned, we engage in collaboration all the time. 
A collaborative community is where the key stakeholder groups in a community get together on an ongoing basis to try to achieve shared outcomes and solve shared problems. And FDA, rather than being the one who leads a particular collaboration or they co-lead, we're a member of that community. And we'll, you know, we will join, you know, under certain circumstances. In fact, we've now joined 10 and we have several more that are coming through. You're going to see several more we jump into this year. And remember, this just started as a uh, strategic priority for us and having these in 2018, you know, and this was new for folks out there. Um, and in a community, um, if that community comes up with a solution that they say, this is what we want to do, um, the FDA will likely adopt it unless it's not in, in the best interest of public health or if it's contrary to our statutory mandate. But we'd like to see the community drive solutions and we would participate um, as a member. And, you know, today uh, there are now ones in ophthalmic imaging, liquid biopsy, artificial intelligence, digital pathology, wound therapy, pharmacogenetics, um, uh, suicide and diabetes. Um, I'm not sure, I, I'm still running it through my head if I hit my 10. Um, but it gives you a flavor of kind of the variety of uh, interactions out there. And like I said, it's got to have the key stakeholder groups. So before I was talking about, you know, the role of patients. So here we're talking about patients, not just as partners with the FDA, but putting them in the co-driver seat in a collaborative community, because we expect patients to be representative there. Um, and that's where they are. They, have a, they now have a voice in that community and are helping to drive the things that may best meet their needs. And by the way, in communities, I missed two of them, which are ones that um, we were particularly instrumental on. They're under the Medical Device Innovation Consortium. And I'm, I'm running to a board meeting right after this. So I'm going to get crap for not saying anything. Uh, but they are for um, our National Evaluation System for Health Technology, or NEST, um, and uh, for our case for quality, about how we drive, you know, greater assurances around uh, quality in uh, in med tech. You know, you, you brought up NEST, um, and so let's talk about that for a second, if, if you would. Um, you've done a really a pioneering effort to try to to revise how we look at surveillance of um, medical products. And so could you talk a little bit about the background behind Nest? And of course we're participating in it. So um, we have a, a vested interest in it working very well. I wonder if you wanted to give some background on Nest and, and what the objective is of that MDIC and, and that whole Nest program. Well, uh, certainly, yes. Um, this whole effort is very uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, and it, it really stemmed out of uh, trying to deal with challenges and taking advantage of opportunities. Um, the challenges is our, the ability to understand the benefit risk profile around the technology, both before it comes to market uh, and after it comes to market. So that's kind of the FDA focus. And the reason being, you know, a lot of times if we need clinical evidence, uh, we were sort of trapped in the world of your traditional clinical trials. And, you know, an advantage in the pristine environment, yes, I can tease out benefits and risks, but is it truly reflective of the real benefit risk profile of a technology, which you often don't understand until it's being used in real world practice. Um, and those are important trade-offs. And clinical trials were becoming increasingly more difficult to conduct and costly to conduct. And on the flip side, in the post-market setting, if we needed additional data or we would let a technology go to the marketplace more quickly and maybe with a little less evidence pre-market if we had you know, high confidence we'd get those answers in a reasonable amount of time post-market. If you're relying on traditional clinical trials, a lot of times patients would not sign up for studies because they could already get that technology, it had already been authorized. And limitations on our surveillance efforts very much dependent upon adverse event reporting which means a person has to see there was a problem, believe it's associated with the device and take the time to report it. That's why, you know, a lot of things take a while before you people identify and report it. So at the same time, increasingly data is being captured electronically. 
And so if we can leverage that data that's being captured, particularly as a part of routine clinical care, then we have the opportunity to understand technologies both before they go to market uh, and after, and to do it in a way that may be better reflecting true benefit risk profile, can do it in a more efficient manner because the data is being collected, but you got to solve other challenges, you know, data quality, data consistency, are we using common, you know, uh, definitions when we're collecting information. Um, but you can also now connect the pipes between data that's connected, collected from different sources. Um, again, challenging, but lots of opportunities and you can provide then apply, you know, advanced analytics on the data. So with that in mind, that kind of led to the idea of, can we establish that infrastructure in the US? But unlike what's been done other times by the FDA, where again, back to that command and control, you know, we're the US government, we're the boss. We said, you know what, this again should be back in a community solution. It should not be the FDA. We should have an independent party that serves as the coordinating center for this system and it should be governed by the community. And that's the way it was conceived and established by day one. So we do not own and operate NEST. NEST is of, by, and for the ecosystem. And that also means it is not being designed for simply FDA purposes. It is designed and being built out to meet the needs of the different uh, stakeholders in our, in our community. Um, so you've got, you know, looking at the patient needs, the healthcare provider needs, the payer needs, of course, regulatory needs and others. And as we look to the future, you know, our hope is we are expanding NEST beyond the current 15 data partners, but we'll also start looking internationally as well. Excellent. You mentioned um, collecting what I call real world evidence from that those nest, uh, you know, gathering the medical records and that sort of thing. Can you give us any ideas or thoughts about how the agency has used real world evidence um, in, in either um, label changes or approval of devices or, or other actions that the agency would take? So the answer is uh, all of the above. Uh, we have used it for, you know, labeling expansions. Um, you know, if you think about, um, uh, I've used this example before, but such a good one, um, a, a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. You know, um, when we authorized um, the very first um, uh, TABR product, we were the 42nd country in the world to do so. Um, when we did that, we had worked with uh, CMS. We had worked with uh, the company who did, you know, Edwards. Uh, we'd worked with healthcare professional societies and the healthcare professional societies um, um, uh, established a registry for these products and future products and CMS granted national coverage uh, for it and would cover new indications if FDA approved it, if you're collecting data into that registry. So didn't need new uh, national coverage determinations. Fast forward a few years, um, we started to see approvals for next technology devices and for new uses uh, moving to first in the world, coming out of the US because of the data being collected in that registry and really saving time. So we've done it for expanded indications. We have new technologies, we've leveraged it like historical controls and to meet post-market uh, data collection requirements. And if you're interested, and I think it's safe for me to say this, and I hope hope nothing got pulled back today. We were going to issue um, um, our uh, 90 examples of our using real world evidence since about 2015, and it covers pre market and post market. We've got a little blog on top of it, to kind of explain the work, but it gives you a flavor. It's not everything, but it gives you a flavor that we are using real world evidence on a day to day basis to inform our decision-making uh, and we're going to continue to grow that out over time. We're seeing more companies get into this space and we think, you know, that nest as that continues to mature could play a critical role uh, as well. So, so talking about patients, you mentioned first in the world uh, and then for, you know, for Tabor, obviously that was a little after some of the other countries, 
But I think now, and certainly wasn't the intent in Europe, that moving from MDD to MDR might push some of the device development back to the US, but I think that's certainly uh, part of what's happening. There's also the early feasibility program, uh, breakthrough devices. Do you have some thoughts there on you know, how we can use those to, to really help bring that development back into the US and get devices available to patients here as, as quickly as possible, those that are safe and effective? Yeah, and you know, I'll first say, you know, I'd mention, you know, with your first of all, and back to our vision about, you know, US patients first in the world for access, that is not about a competition between countries. We are not in competition with Europe or anyone else. Um, in fact, we're engaged in international efforts to try to converge or harmonize, you know, our systems. So in reality, we think real success is that great technology is available around the world, you know, at pretty much the same time. That's that, that to us would be a, a, a wonderful achievement uh, to occur. And we could always talk about what's happening in the international space. Uh, but that first in the world is more just a good metric about what's timely patient access. If it comes here first or in parallel with other major markets, then you've got you know, timely access and you know, it's, it's just a good goal to achieve. Um, that in mind, you mentioned two programs, you know, breakthrough early feasibility. You know, in early feasibility, we certainly recognize that where you study a technology early is the markets you will tend to bring it early as you build, you know, get that clinical community gets a more of a taste and understanding of that technology. So we knew if we could, you know, um, reset, you know, the thinking around early feasibility studies in the US, we could draw some of that innovation back over here. Um, and the way we had things set up before was a lot more challenging. And so uh, we put out new policy around early feasibility studies. We've been working with the Medical Device Innovation Consortium um, around addressing non-regulatory issues, such as around uh, IRB approvals and contracting uh, and enrollment to subjects. And you're gonna hear more about this from uh, Andy Farb, I think a little bit later. So I'm not gonna go into details, but you know, we've, as a result, seen essentially a doubling of the number of early feasibility studies, you know, for which we get submissions here in the US. And uh, we're authorizing those about 80% in the first cycle. So, you know, really good things that we're seeing. You'll hear more from Andy in terms of what's happening with uh, MDIC, uh, which we think those combined efforts really can make a difference in driving more innovation back to the US. And the breakthrough, you know, device program uh, as something we actually piloted uh, back in 2011 as the innovation pathway. We then set it up in 2015 as the expanded access pathway program. And then Congress instantiated in the law, we branded it Breakthrough Devices um, uh, back in December of 2016. So that's a program today. But since um, April of 2015, we have given a designation of Breakthrough Device to over 400 medical devices. It, the numbers essentially doubled every year until last year when it went up by about 50%. So I think last year we had designated a, something around 150. Uh, the year before was about 100, a little over 100, then it was like 55, you know, give you a flavor how it's ramped up. Um, under that program, if you meet the criteria, so you're intended, you know, to treat or diagnose a life-threatening, irreversibly debilitating condition, and you meet an unmet medical need, which is, you know, there's nothing else out there in the space for dealing with this, you're safer, more effective, or best interest of public health, then you could qualify for breakthrough. And in return, we provide a higher level of engagement. In fact, we offer something we call, um, uh, oh, why am I, uh, I'm blanking. I'm having one of those, you know, comics have it when they up on stage, regulators have them too. Uh, sprint, regulatory sprint. Um, where essentially there's a tough issue that we and the company are going to tackle and we sort of commit to try to do it within 45 days. And if it's really hard, we can't get there, maybe we'll do a second sprint, but that's the idea. Let's solve, let's solve early and let's solve fast. Um, and we're starting to see that payoff, you know, dividends, uh, about 25 devices have been authorized as breakthrough already PMA de novo and 510k always the examples. And because we engage early, a lot of these you're not going to see for a period of time come to the marketplace. Now, CMS has a regulation, or hopefully, you know, we'll see if the Biden administration keeps in place, 
but it essentially gives automatic Medicare reimbursement as long as you got a benefit category and applies to Medicare patients. Um, if you are a breakthrough device as designated by the FDA and we authorize you. So you get automatic coverage for four years. You've got to get post-market data then to sort of meet CMS criteria to maintain that coverage. So that goes into effect. That's a major shot in the arm on innovation in the U.S. because you have predictable, you know, reimbursement for those technologies, you know, if you get authorized by the FDA. And that's something actually uh, we had put on the table a number of years ago, and really credit to my colleagues in CMS uh, who, um, who put out that regulation. And we've had a great interaction around that over the past few years. Um, so those, that's just a flavor of some of the things that I think will continue to drive innovation in the US. We earlier on mentioned uh, regulatory science and quite frankly, think about it this way. If you're innovative technology and you've got scientific challenges or there are not established standards and methods to evaluate your device, you've got a big hurdle to get over. And investing on that sort of uh, pre-competitive regulatory science space in establishing those kind of tools, the kind of work that OCEL does with partners um, can really make a difference because you've essentially de-risking the development of those technologies, which means easier pathway to market and more attractive for investors to put dollars into it. So yeah, and thanks for bringing up the international harmonization piece. I know Neil mentioned HBD earlier and there's actually an HBD panel coming up tonight that a few of us are on. Um, so that's uh, international harmonization with Japan. Uh, there's MD staff, which is looking at manufacturing. What are your thoughts on, you know, looking farther into the future? Do you ever see a, a vision where there'll be some sort of global, uh, you know, global type of regulatory approval? Is that achievable? Well, um, we think it is achievable. In fact, we have been driving um, a working group in the International Medical Device Regulars, Regulators Forum, IMDRF, uh, which replaced the Global Harmonization Task Force now almost a decade ago. Um, and we are leading the Good Regulatory Review Practices Working Group, a mouthful. Bureaucrats, by the way, regulators, we suck at branding, just to be clear. So we have IMDRF, GRRP, but here's what it's about. While IMDRF has not yet agreed, the member countries have not yet agreed to establish a medical device single review program, they have agreed to put the building blocks in place. And that's what this working group that we co-lead has been doing over the past several years. Can we harmonize around you know, essential principles and what it takes to have confidence in a entity that conducts pre-market review and how that information is conveyed, all those different nuts and bolts for a program. Um, and it's my hope that ultimately that group will agree, let's, like we set up the medical device single audit program, let's establish the medical device single review program, but this time let's give it a better name. The challenge for us though, is the US, I'm gonna be honest. We are one of the big, we're the big, or one of the big drivers for MD CERP, but our challenge is that our regulatory framework is different than most other countries. We were earlier than most other countries, but as a result, the later countries rallied around a different model. And there are pros and cons to each, and the, the earlier model from the EU, everyone knows is changing, you know, with, uh, with, the, M, with the MDR, with the IBDR. Um, and so the question is, um, where do we go in the future for the U.S.? Now, we believe the framework that Congress put in place over 40 years ago, you know, was designed for the technologies of the time. It's not fit for purpose for many of the modern technologies that we deal with today. And as a result, we struggle at the FDA in trying to put, you know, that square peg in a round hole. Things like digital health, if you're truly a software-based technology, the regulatory frameworks, they are not, you know, they're not fit for purpose. So it is my hope we will have the opportunity to revisit those frameworks. And in doing so, let's keep in mind how we can do it to still meet the U.S. standard with reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness, which I think is a great standard. Um, do it in a risk-based manner, assure things are least burdensome, but line it up 
so that we are in a position to harmonize where it makes sense and if not, certainly converge uh, where it doesn't. And if so, we truly could have an effective MD CERP and essentially you get a global passport that allows your technology entry to multiple marketplaces. And that to me will be a win for the US because there'll be a better driver on innovation to begin with and we can leverage work happening elsewhere and it will be a major boost in the arm for global health all around. That's great. We have one, one more minute for um, talking about uh, what's going on at the FDA. Uh, one of the areas that's been especially challenging and the, the, infra, the ecosystem in the state of Indiana has really uh, put a lot of focus on this and that's pediatric patients. So we have a number of consortium and other groups that are working on pediatric patients here. And I know that uh, the agency has supported that in a number of different ways and wondered if you wanted to just detail some of those ways in which FDA has, has worked on uh, providing, uh, you know, resources and collaboration on, on products for pediatric patients. Yeah, you know, pediatrics, um, you know, it is so unfortunate, you know, for our children um, who are, I think, at a disadvantage when it comes to medical technology, because um, really the, the system today is not designed to best support the development of innovative products for them. And too often leveraging technologies designed for adults and then, you know, reconfiguring them or making do with them uh, to take care of uh, of, of, our, of our kids. Um, and so, you know, challenge here is you deal with small patient populations often, and as a result, not strong incentives to invest and make technology. And quite frankly, you know, if they're higher risk, um, you have your options of, uh, if they're above this 8,000 number cutoff, you may be going through a very rigorous pre-market approval uh, program with all the data needs. And quite frankly, that's too high a bar to go through. If you're at this 8,000 or below, you can go through what we call humanitarian device exemption. It is a, a more lenient standard to market around probable benefits outweigh probable risks. Uh, it's got a lot of hoops attached to it though, around going through an IRB, um, keeping track on the numbers. You can collect profits in the pediatric space. Uh, there are limitations if you're in the adult space. And we haven't seen that pathway used uh, all that much. And so there's a regulatory issue. Uh, we think that should be, you know, are talking about changing that. Let's get away from HDE. In fact, we think there's a model that could be in place that allows you to come to market on the HDE standard, but without the bells and whistles. That ultimately goes to the, the true standard, reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness. So ultimately greater confidence in technology and more likely payers will support it, but in a very streamlined fashion. I know we're out of time, so I'm going to put that out as a teaser. Um, the other is around the evidence collection. Uh, so we've invested. So first of all, we've got a consortium of institutions, um, academic centers who serve as a resource for innovators in the pediatric device development space. And uh, you know we've been pumping money into that uh, for several years, and that's really driven a number of technologies to be developed. Um, and the other is this uh, Ship MD effort really bring the community together and, you know, ultimately leveraging that expertise, um, you know, the data and capabilities in there and hopefully building out really more of a, an evaluation network uh, that we could sort of study technologies being developed, reduce the costs on evidence de development in that fashion. And I think if we do that and kind of that real world evidence generation and confidence we can collect the data we can build that regulatory pathway not locked into 8,000 that allows this glide path for technologies for our kids, you know, get responsibly on the marketplace and used uh, and used for them. And I, I am really hopeful that as part of this revisit of the regulatory paradigms for medical devices, we have a particular focus on pediatrics. So looking at the list of, of questions here, um, and then Jeff, if you're, I think we've got you to 11.15 on our schedule, so hopefully you, you've got another 10 minutes or so. Yes. Okay, great. 
Uh, I'm looking at some Depends of the on your questions, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about combination products? What do you think of that one? Oh, boy. All right. <laughs> And so, and this is talking about, you know, in particular, we're looking to new products that are developed, new technologies like cells, tissues, um, and how those are combined with devices. Uh, you know, how do we, what are some of the pathways there to help you navigate that whole process? Uh, yeah, so this is, to me, I, I'm going to give you my personal view. Uh, this is sort of the bad news space. Uh, you know, the world of today, the way it's set up is, you look at what is the primary mode of action, you know, for that for that product. And if it's a biologics, you know, drugs, you're going to go down that pathway. If it's device, you're going to go device. But if you've got a biologic or drug component, you are very likely uh, to get pulled in that direction anyway. Um, and it's very hard for developers, you know, to navigate. If you're predominantly, you know, drug biologic, you're going down, you know, those pathways anyway, that's a, that's probably a little bit easier, but if you're mostly med tech, uh, very hard. And so we see lots of developers struggle, products that take a very long time to get to market, even if they would. I have been a strong proponent, but I'm speaking personally, that we got to change the regulatory paradigm. It is, again, not fit for purpose for combination products. I had hoped it would be on the table as a, as a add-on when we did user fee legislation uh, back in 2016. Um, I don't know what will be back on the table as we go for the next round of user fee authorization, which is going to happen next year. Uh, but it's my hope that we, uh, we solve it because we're not seeing the kind of innovation in this space that we otherwise uh, that we otherwise could see, and it could be around this idea of something coming out of also COVID, where we saw the value around regulatory flexibility. You know, our emergency use authorization authorities that kicked in allowed us to better craft what that pathway looked like. You know, to the kind of technology which today, in peacetime, if you will, we can't do, and we've been strong proponents of what we call agile regulation. Rather than saying you have to do A, B, C, and D for this kind of risk product to get in the market, and if you don't, sorry, it's to say you have A, B, C, and D building blocks. Leverage them as is appropriate as long as you meet certain constraints. You got to meet that U.S. standard. It's got to be risk-based, least burdensome, and others. And then you can really tailor that pathway to the technology and allow us to do some innovative things around the technology and digital health, we've been piloting um, an approach that doesn't just look at the technology, it looks at the developer. And if we have confidence in capabilities of the developer, we may not need to do the same kind of deep dive on the technology before it hits the marketplace. And if you combine that with a learning model around real world evidence, we can have a very responsible, robust, probably a better system for understanding technology but also one that better meets the rapid innovation cycles we see in digital health. And so, and that kind of concept of looking at developer is also a piece of what uh, we and others have been looking at for a modern framework around these in vitro clinical tests as well. So let's have a modern agile regulatory approach to modern, innovative, rapidly changing technologies. And that is something that could be applied in combination products that we think would be incredibly successful. You know, um, one of the one of the areas that's been problematic in the past, and I think the agency is solving it, is the is when there's a novel product that really should be class one or class two, but there's not the classification for that and so it gets thrown into class three and then requires reclassification. And the agency has put de novo process in place. Could you talk a little bit about how that de novo process is evolving and what it accomplishes for people who are doing innovation? Uh, absolutely. I mean, so de novo really is one of those opportunities that if we have a technology, you know, it's new, you don't, you don't know it. Um, it's not going to be able to take advantage of 510K. And if it's not, you know, um, truly out of the game, well, it might be for class one, but 
Um, if you've got nothing else like it, then you've got to understand that technology first. And essentially, if you're demonstrated you're not high risk, then you, we can kind of put you in one of the other buckets. And so the de novo is, you can almost think about it's a bridge, you know, for, for getting there. So we're saying we don't think you're going to be high risk, but we've got to figure out that bucket where you go and you can't take advantage of the pathways out there. Now, if we move to this kind of agile regulation approach, we could probably better fine tune for some of these new technologies that don't have a happy home yet, if you will. And they're not going to, you know, they're not the high risk, uh, but they would be elsewhere um, uh, to do that outside of your traditional de novo. However, the revamped de novo from a few years ago has made a difference. I and mean, we have seen, you know, more products coming through. So we've also seen our review times on de novo really dramatically drop. So it's become much more of a viable pathway, which it was not, you know, a good half dozen years ago. Uh, but if we really want to make smart changes, we'd go over to this agile regulation model. So one question, I know we're, we're getting close on time, so I wanted to make sure I got it in here because it's something that, you know, that's certainly near and dear to us. Uh, but we've got a series of, of graduate courses in regulatory. We're trying to put together a, you know, a certificate and keep pursuing that educational piece. But, but what are your thoughts on how can we, you know, kind of as a group of stakeholders, so academics, industry, FDA, et cetera, how do we train new scientists, new engineers, and really get them interested and, and draw them into the regulatory field? Uh, so they don't escape into other kind of other realms. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. Um, you know, certainly there are institutions around the country and increasingly who have um, created programs around you know um, uh, medical device you know development that also you know walks folks through for developers or interested you know innovators. The different things along that life cycle and that includes you know certainly on the regulatory side too um, some of them are also offering kind of build outs in some of that work for uh, people who are in disciplines that may be applied for med tech so they can just start understanding um, sort of the, the regulatory side and then regulatory science you could think about it as this is more applied um, in particular cases around the evaluation of a, of a device. And so if you're looking to provide that training, my suggestion is one, um, leverage some of the trainings that are already out there. You know, some curriculums have been made available. We ourselves have developed use cases for some of those, you know, programs like out at Stanford. Um, in the regulatory science side, as you deal, you know, delve deeper, I think people need clinical, uh, practical experience. So think about a practicum too. It's not just uh, what we learn um, between, uh, you know, in the classroom and in a lab setting, but get them out there, you know, with developers, maybe an opportunity of things we can do over at the FDA, um, can give people, you know, a nice flavor. And of course, if you build your own programs that are engaged in regulatory science, well, what a wonderful laboratory you know, for training the, you know, the next generation of folks, because those are the people who really are going to take us, you know, to the next star and investing in their future is really investing in all of our future. No, great, great thought. Neil, do you have a, maybe one more? Yeah, let me, um, let me just ask, um, how we bet, how would an academic organization best interact with the agency to try to meet the demands that the agency might have for uh, reviewers and staff? Um, and how would the academic group set that up to best provide those uh, resources? Best, uh, just to ask for clarification, the resources to the reviewers themselves um the, the training of reviewers so that because you have a constant uh, need for new reviewers that have good background in science and and of course you have an internal training program for them on the regulations but how would a group like purdue that's been training for several years 
and, and actually has had um, FDA folks in the training courses helping to do some of the, the content. Uh, but, but how would you um, see it best working that, uh, that these groups around the nation can prepare someone who might then want to go to the agency and be a reviewer? Yeah, no, uh, really good question. So it's kind of back to um, some of those basic curriculums on bio design. I think are important because it's not just um, understanding on the regulatory side. I, we think our reviewers need to understand, you know, the ecosystem and the entire life cycle of a product. So we have uh, something called our experiential learning program, in which we send our um, our staff. They may be reviewers or others out there in the real world. Uh, so you know they they leave the you know the Disney World of the Mid Atlantic that we call Washington D.C. Um, and we send them out in the real world. And so they will go to um, uh, manufacturer sites, or clinical sites. They can come if it you know it's going to be a good learning opportunity to you know, academic institutions. Usually for about a could be a week or two. They've gone to in you know innovation hubs to really learn about aspects that maybe are directly related to their day-to-day -day work or have a richer understanding around the challenges, what it takes for technology to really make it all the way from concept uh, and through the life cycle. Um, and so if you really think about, if you're going to train people, train them on all those aspects because they need to have a full 360 understanding, even if they spend most of their day around what people will think about review. And in fact, at our center, we've moved away from people who tend to be just purely a pre-market review. We now are training our folks and have organized into teams of total product lifecycle reviewers, we call them. And so folks really are getting understanding of pre-market review, quality compliance, post-market surveillance. So they can do a 360 from an FDA standpoint and then get them you know, connected in with patient groups, provider groups, starting to get them engaged with payers um, and you know, understanding the entire innovation cycle. So they can bring that to the table when they deal with technologies. I would say, bake that into a training program, make it practical. You gotta have lots of examples to walk people through, you know, what happened, what was the thinking. And if you can get them out you know, with practical experience, that's terrific and for our folks, Again, you know, those kind of coursework, but also other opportunities where maybe there's something, you know, that's on site that's more practical too, that we can leverage uh, as well and build that relationship. And, you know, it could also serve as a source for folks who maybe get pulled into the FDA. And we've got that relationship with a number of institutions that are serving as, if you will, feeders for future uh, FDA employees. Wonderful. No, I wish we could uh, talk for a few more hours and I apologize for folks. I know you sent questions and we didn't get a chance to get through all those, um, but I do want to be respectful of your time. So I know you've got other places to go, but again, Jeff, thank you so much for joining. It was really great to hear your thoughts, insights, kind of see where, uh, where FDA is going. Hopefully we can talk again soon and we, we've got a short break here. So we'll see everyone back at 1125. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Yep. Thanks, Neil.